This is our CAS special event. Uh, this event is going to be a little different in the sense that we're hoping um, for this event to be more interactive than normal. So I'm going to um, share a couple things with you before we get started. Um, so first I'm going to pull up um, this PowerPoint. So I just wanted to make sure we're going to be using annotate and we're going to be using polling. And we're also going to be using um, just asking people to unmute and uh, talk back and forth with us more conversationally. Um, so I know I've struggled with finding where annotate is on Zoom. So I just copied these and threw them up on the screen for a second uh, to show um, if, so now that I'm sharing, we should all be able to annotate. So I'd like to invite you to find your um, annotate uh, button and just doodle on my screen for a little bit to show me that, um, that you have found it. And I'm going to set it up so that the annotation is anonymous. So can everyone find annotate? Okay, see some. There are, so there's drawing, there's stamps. The stamps are pretty fun. Um, you can type. All right, so if anyone's having trouble finding annotate and uh, wants to unmute and speak up, we can maybe help help everybody find it. Yeah, I can't find it. Okay, so are you on a desktop or a mobile? Uh, desktop. Okay, so if you go to the top, there's, um, I think, on, at least on mine, if you go to the top of the screen, there's view options. Do you um, see that? Yeah. Okay, so then you should be able to find annotate within that menu. Yeah. You see it? Yeah. All right, I got it. Awesome. Okay, great. So <laughs> when are we going to talk about aliens? I have, I have a suspicion. I know who wrote that. Um, okay, so everybody found annotate? Everybody can unmute and say yes. <laughs> and we'll practice unmuting and not being shy. Of course. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. So, um, now, this is the part where I practice remembering how to clear everything before we go on to the next slide. Okay, so then, um, all right, so with that out of the way, I wanted to uh, welcome everybody to um, this research symposium. So this is, um, this is, I'm a part of a mentoring organization called Polaris. And the Polaris Mentorship Program couples um, undergraduates in STEM fields with um, senior undergraduates and graduate students as mentors to introduce them to research and just form like a support community and network for, for new students, um, especially students in underrepresented uh, communities. And so I've been working with Polaris for two years. Um, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I've invited the students when they finish their research projects this semester, I invited them to come to CAS and give um, a presentation of what they learned over the uh, last two semesters. But most of the research was over this last semester. Um, also, as part of this, um, I promised uh, I promised Cass in the past that I would be willing to talk about my research like once a year, once every other year. And I have some new research that I'm also going to talk about today. Um, the last time I presented to Cass, it was very technical. And since then, I've been training with the Astronomy Ambassadors Group. And they have a grant from the National Science Foundation to study how, um, how to be more effective with outreach. So as part of this training, I have converted my technical talk to a more public talk. And I'm going to be giving that today um, 
the undergrads are also going to be presenting today and I'll be one of the presenters and I'll be presenting using on the spot feedback. Um, I'm going to throw up this slide as a disclaimer. <laughs> so as a part of this training, um, my, my personal presentation will be being observed tonight um, to sort of assess the effectiveness of using on the spot feedback um, in doing outreach. So we have, I believe, two observers here with us tonight, and it's really good to see you. Thank you for coming. Um, so they will be they will be observing and evaluating um, my presentation personally. So I wanted to flash that up just to let everybody know that there are some observers tonight. Um, and then that's all I have as an introduction. Um, so to get started. Um, Okay, so I don't know if we have, if anyone new has joined. Uh, anybody new has joined that hasn't used Annotate? Is there anyone here that doesn't know how to use Annotate? Please speak up if so. Okay, all right. Of course, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen one, one more time. We'll get this Annotate set up because that's, um, it's a big part of the presentation tonight, I think, but it's a fun part. So let me, okay, so here's some, here's some directions. So I think uh, to find the annotate menu, you go up to the top of the screen, you'll see something that says view options. And then in that menu, you'll find annotate. And there are quite a few um, different ways you can doodle on the screen. So I invite you all to just start doodling. Um, and then uh, once everybody knows how to use annotate. So, and once again, um, these presentations are designed to be uh, more on the interactive side. So please um, feel free to unmute, to uh, ask questions. We will be asking a lot of questions in our presentation. Feel free to just speak up and blurt something out. There are no, um, no right or wrong answers in the sense that we're all learning together and we're all exploring together. All right, so everybody good on annotate? All right, so I am gonna practice, uh, I'm gonna practice clearing the screen. Okay, y'all have to stop now <laughs> and I'll clear the screen and then we'll move on. Great, thank you. Oh, I guess it doesn't matter. I'll just unshare the screen. Thank you, everybody. Um, okay, so we can get started with our talks. So our first presentation it's gonna be given by Kaya Atzberger. And Kaya is a first year at OSU. She's majoring in astrophysics with a minor in both dance and planetary science. And um, she loves reading and music. And the title of Kaya's talk is about variable star systems. everyone see it? Thumbs up. Perfect. Okay. In that case, hi, I'm Kaya Atzberger. This is my presentation about variable stars systems. And they're really interesting. I think you're going to find it pretty fascinating. Variable stars make up the majority of stars that we see in the night sky. And it's, they're really interesting. I won't go too much into it, but one of the reasons we study them is because they tell us a lot about exoplanets and their properties in other solar systems. So those planets orbit these variable star systems just like our Earth orbits the sun. However, you can't know about those properties unless you first learned about the stars. So that's where we're going to start. So in order to understand it better, you need a good background. And the different types of variable stars can be divided by intrinsic and extrinsic properties. They have the different internal stars, which have chemical properties that cause them to pulsate, whereas the external systems blink in and out due to outside sources, which will block light from the observing lens. So both categories are periodic, but, and, but they have varying brightness by different methods, and they result in different periods. So I wanted to start with an activity where I'm going to give you different types of these stars. And I want you to guess if it's an intrinsic or extrinsic property. And you can use the annotation tool to kind of mark in one of the gray, gray squares. It doesn't matter which one you choose, the top or bottom. It's the same thing. 
So let's start with eclipsing binaries, which we'll talk more about in the next slide as well. But that's when you have two stars and one orbits in front of the other. And when that happens, you lose a little bit of light. Does that sound like something that you think is an internal or external property? So start guessing. Oh, good. It seems like you guys are getting it. OK, so you are all correct. It is an external property. So the next one are eruptive stars. That's when the star itself is having some kind of explosion within it or the entire thing could be expanding really rapidly and blowing up almost, or it can actually blow up. So yeah, this is good. You guys are all getting it. So that is an internal property. And once again, it doesn't matter you chose the top box, it's the same thing. And then the next one is a pulsating star. This one, I think for me was a bit of a tricky one. This is a star that kind of blinks in and out. So do you think that's an internal or external property? Okay. So we have a little bit of division on this one, which makes sense because I think it was confusing when I first learned it, but it is an internal property because the star itself is pulsating because of its own properties. But if you think about it, when I was explaining, it does, it blinks. So you might think that something outside of it is causing that, but it is the star itself. Then our last one, you can probably guess because it's the only one left, are rotating variables, which just means that from the observing lens, it's moving in a way that we can't see it the same, but the star itself isn't changing. So yeah, that one is an external property as you could guess by process of elimination. And let me just, I'm gonna clear your drawings now. Thank you for participating. Um, okay, there are also more types of these within the categories. I won't go too much into it because it just gets complicated and they're just different specifications. But one you might notice if you know a little bit about astronomy are supernovae, which are just kind of interesting. They are when the stars explode. It's what happens when I was saying the mass kind of goes out and expands. But if you don't know about it, that's also okay. You don't need to know more about it for this. So. For the purposes of the research I did, there's really just two types of binary star systems you need to know about, which when I kind of make this transition, binary stars are essentially the same as variable star systems. So you can kind of use those as interchangeable terminology. So don't let that get you thrown off. And these systems are largely categorized by how you discover them. The most important we have are these two. And the eclipsing binary, as we talked about before, when the, you're categorizing them, is when you have the two stars eclipsing one another and you lose light based on the angle. And as you can see in the image here, when they pass each other, you can see different amounts of light, whereas when they're both side by side, you can see both of them at once. But if the angle of the observing lens isn't good for this, you can also use spectroscopy. And you can see the Doppler shift, which will tell you what the different stars properties are. And if you don't know what that is, you can kind of see in the picture for the spectroscopic binary, the green dot would be your observing lens. And depending on the time, the blue or orange star is coming closer or farther from the green dot, which is just going to tell you if it's a blue or red shift, which is just on your spectra in the bottom when it's in the blue or the red. And the data that we take is how many photons the telescope receives, which is just the light particles. So when you're doing this, it's often better to have a large telescope, which can collect more photons. And speaking of telescopes, we can move on to the assassin data, which is what Ohio State uses. It's a series of four cameras that are used to photograph the night sky. And this is an image just from yesterday afternoon of how many times they viewed all different parts in the night sky. And you can see there's some overlap between the little four camera segments. And this just happens when you have the little squares taking up a sphere, but some of the overlap, there are a lot of times observed in certain areas. And these are areas that might be more interesting to observe somewhere with a lot of binary star systems that are 
easily detectable or really relevant to an active area of research. So it's just kind of interesting to see where the astronomers are interested in looking at binary stars or what we've been able to see using the telescopes. So the next area is what we're using the data for. So now that we've had the telescopes, we've collected our data, what do we do with it? And what we're gonna do is find the period of these stars using phase folding. So unlike movement with respect to time, phase folding has movement with respect to position. So if you have a clock and you start in the, at the 12 clock, that is your zero. And if you go all the way back, that's one. So when you're at six o'clock, you're 50% through the phase. And when you're back at 12, that's 100% through the phase. So if you have this over and over and you go through multiple phases, we can layer the data and then get these diagrams that are on the right side of the screen. And these show magnitude versus phase and the brightness as a function can be used to tell us about their cycles. The cycles imply different characteristics about the orbits and sizes. And by graphing it, we can see the shape of where the eclipses take place. It's only present if we use correct boundary conditions and that involves kind of a complicated code that you don't need to worry about. But it's really interesting to see what we can find out from it. And when I was doing my research with this, I created this table of stars and the, re the yellow star four is indicating this graph on the bottom, which is a little bit messier. And you just see some data points lying around because it wasn't the ideal star or the right conditions to view it. And star nine in green, that has a period of around 12 days, is the graph on top. That has really clear little and big dips. So I have a question for you now about these dips. For the smaller dip, do you think this is when a larger star passes in front of a little star or when a little star passes in front of a larger star? And for this, feel free to type something in the chat or just unmute, that would honestly be easier too. So just make a guess. Well, the little dip is a secondary eclipse from a, a rotating uh, binary pair. So it's the, uh, uh, the brighter, the, so the decrease in magnitude is smaller, so it's the dimmer star that is being eclipsed. Uh, Saying it's when the bigger star is in front of the little one? Well, it's, if the bigger star is the brighter star, yes, but if the bigger, the smaller star is the brighter star, then it's the dimmer star. You, know, you can't go by size, you have to go by magnitudes. That's a good way to put it because you bring up an interesting point about the magnitude and with respect to size of a star. And when we're talking about these, it's almost something that you don't necessarily have to think about because when you have the bigger star, you're getting that much light. And when you have the little star, you're getting so much light as well. So if you have the little star in front of the bigger star, you're getting all the little star and you're losing a little bit of the big stars. And when you have the bigger star in front of the little star, you're getting all the big stars light and none of the little stars light. So the small dip comes when the smaller star passes in front of the large one because it's less massive and doesn't block as much of the total light. And the larger star blocks all the smaller stars light. So this is only for when the period is fully aligned. And as you see, the dips kind of change as it moves to different angles. So you, make, you do make an interesting point about when the magnitudes are different. But for most stars, you're gonna have the larger one giving more light in total. So when we're moving on from this, we wanna to get to what's the point? Why do we care about it all? So here's an image you might recognize if you've seen Star Wars. So when I was telling you earlier about finding out characteristics of exoplanets, we can take this and see that for an example like this, we have a binary star system with the exoplanet orbiting around it in the solar system. So once you can find out about stars, about these two stars' properties, you can use it to find things about the composition, the mass, the radius of this exoplanet. So it's just a really interesting thing to know. And since there are so many of these systems, it's a really important thing to be researching. And that's about all I have. So if anyone has any questions, let me know.
Well, I'm a little confused by the previous charts that you had up. I wasn't entirely sure what I was looking at. Yeah, okay. So let me go back. Are you talking about the diagrams on the right? Yeah. Okay, so I can explain those a little bit more. Um, the phase which I was talking about is on the x-axis. That's what we have down here. We go from, this has a repeated phase. It just extends it so you can see the pattern better. But we're, what we're doing is going from zero to one. And it's just um, a chosen period, a chosen position of when it's orbiting here, the two stars, we're, our zero position is some and then when it gets back all the way through its orbit back to the same place, that's our one. So we're finding the different magnitudes, the total magnitude of both the stars throughout that cycle. And that's how we get the little and the bigger dips. And then if you get thrown off at all by the bar on the right, the colors are just um, corresponding to abundances. So you don't really have to worry about it, but it's just telling you how many times it's been in one position. The magnitude, the amount of light? Yeah, so how many times when it's been at that phase it's had a certain magnitude? Because they take these, they take this data over multiple years. I know in the code I was doing, it's all the data from 2013 to the present. So it happens a lot of, they'll have the same thing happening a lot of times, especially for something like star nine, which has a period of 12 days. They've had lots of periods of 12 days since 2013. Or some of them could have a longer period like star four. And there are periods of binary star systems even longer than like 21 days. They can have super long periods or they can have short periods. But for these, you will have a lot of reading. There's a lot of interesting things you can tell about the shape uh, tell from the shape of the curve as well. Can you talk about that as well? Yeah, so um, I kind of brought it up a little bit before with how you can kind of, you have a bit of a messier graph on the bottom than the one on the top. But from the different shapes, you can kind of tell different properties about the star. And you can tell things. The period is the most interesting thing I think I learned about when we were studying them. But a lot of times you can find different characteristics about the star itself. You can find out things about its radius and you can kind of just imply different things about that. So there's so many things you can take from it. I know far from all of it, but yeah. Can I ask you a quick question, uh, technical question? Is, uh, these uh, phase diagrams, did they come out of the uh, AAVSO's V star or did they come out of another program? Um, <clears throat> say your question again, sorry. <laughs> okay, well, you need to handle the data for the phase diagram and the AAVSO uses V star and some other, pe some other people, uh, gosh, what is it, light curve? I think that may be it. I haven't used mm -hmm. light curve. But is, is that how you handled your data? Uh, is, did you just? Yeah, all the data, it does come from the light curves. So. Oh, yeah, but uh, the, the data analysis, the getting the phase diagram, uh, you, you have a program. I just, okay, it's just technically. Uh, I, I'm just familiar with one, one, one set of programs. I was just curious. Uh, he's, he's asking about yeah. the software that's used. Yeah, oh yeah, I think yeah. I see. Okay, I see what you're saying now. This it went through a Python program, so it was just a series of condensing the assassin data into different files, and then putting it through just okay. different calculations to get these curves. Okay, I was just I was just curious. So it's, yeah, no, it's a good question. No, it's well, no. Uh, uh, because we in the AABSO get a lot of the assassination, assassination, yeah, the, uh, assassin data, and we, we pipe it through into uh, what we call V-stars, so we, we can generate the light curve and then the phase diagram from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the assassin data, it's really interesting. 
And if I go back, if I go back here, you can see they really just, they have so much data taken. They have essentially times observed over 294 for essentially all of the night sky. So that's a really cool thing to have. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Kaya. It was a great talk. Thank you. Let's see. I'll stop sharing this now. Okay, so we can move on to our second talk of the night. Um, this next talk is going to be given by Mary Rickle. And Mary is a first year astronomy and physics double major at Ohio State University. Um, she's very passionate about diversity and inclusion work, and she is the program chair for the Sci Access Zenith Mentorship Program and secretary for the Astronomers Without Borders Accessibility and Inclusion Working Group. And one super fun fact about Mary is that she's flown a plane before. I definitely want to ask her about that later. <laughs> um, Mary's talk is titled Classifying Galaxies as AGN or Star Formation Dominant from Emission Spectra. Thank you so much for that, Ness. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, can everybody, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Um, are there any of the little black boxes obstructing anything? <laughs> awesome. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Rickle. And as Ness said, I'm an undergraduate at Ohio State, double majoring in astronomy and physics. And today I will be talking about how I worked with my Polaris mentor to classify galaxies as star formation or AGN dominated from their emission spectra. Okay, so to begin with, why do we even need to make this classification to begin with? So knowing if a galaxy is AGN or star formation dominance, and when I mean dominance, I mean the majority of the light that comes from it is from this, those specific physical processes. It allows astronomers to make more conclusions about stellar populations, tracking star formation rates, knowing where the active black holes are, and also learning about what makes a galaxy active. So I want to talk a little bit about spectra and the technique that we use to make these conclusions. Since all of these objects are really far away, spectra is a wonderful tool to learn more about what's going on without directly observing them like you would in the lab. But what is spectra? Spectra is a specific technique that examines the light from a distant object. And I have a few examples to help demonstrate what it is and why we use it. So let's say we have a light source. We've got a light bulb here. In an ideal case with perfect absorption, we can see the entire visible light spectrum. There's no obstruction and we see every wavelength um, from the light. Now let's say that we have a region of gas in front of this light source. So this light source could be the light bulb or it could also be, um, for example, a star. And so the incoming light is absorbed by the gas surrounding the, the light source. Okay, so I have this light bulb here on the left, this gas region in the middle, and then here we've got a diffraction grating and we're able to obtain that absorption spectrum. And then moving on, we have um, this same light source. And again, this could be a star, for example also is able to impact the gas region. So the energy from this light source or from the star is able to ionize atoms in the gas region. And from this, light is given off by the gas as a result of the light source. So the light source excites the surrounding gas and as a result will emit a specific frequency. And now line emissions are much more relevant to us and as uh, as you will see in my presentation, we'll talk a little bit more about the specific ones that we are using to make these classifications. And I'm just warning that there will be some flashing colors on the next slide. So fireworks, emission lines are kind of like fireworks. So elements are going to, when they're excited, for example, in a firework, when that combustion reaction happens, 
specific frequencies of light, which we see as different colors, are specific to the elements that are being excited. And this is very similar to what we see in some astro um, processes. The excited gas will release photons that correspond to specific frequencies. Okay. Um, and just to touch over again, what spectra is, uh, spectrum shows the intensity of light being absorbed or emitted over a range of energies. And it's the intensity and the presence of certain lines that allow us to draw conclusions. All right, so how do we get the light from these galaxies? There's a variety of wonderful telescopes that exist that uh, whose sole job is to get this. Um, and when we get the light from the galaxy, we're getting all of the light and everything that's contributing to it. So it could be stars, it could be other sources of light, but we're getting just kind of like a conglomeration of different light. And it's astronomers job to sort through these spectra and to make conclusions about the physical processes behind them. And we've also found that certain emission lines are linked to physical processes. And specifically for my presentation, and I'll get into a little bit more about the specific data that we used, but we used the data release seven from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the different classifications. So star formation, also known as H2 regions, um, are regions of gas surrounding young stars. And it's the energy from stars in these regions that ionize the surrounding gas. And from this, we obtain the emission spectrum from the excited gas. And we find that the strongest emission line from H2 regions is H alpha, which is also red optical light. And we can see on the right, we've got the Orion Nebula. We have um, areas of red visible light. In addition, we find that H2 regions star formation regions also range in metal abundances. And we'll talk a little bit more about why this is important and how this will also correlate into temperature and the relationship that we find with that. Okay. And here's some lovely, pretty pictures. H2 regions are nice, fun pictures in astronomy. Um, on the left, we've got the Whirlpool Galaxy which is M51, and we can see that there are those little packets, little patches of red light, and it's in these regions, it's in these patches of red light that we see a lot of star formation. And then on the right, we have M84, which is the Bard Spiral Galaxy, um, and we find that the, both of these galaxies have a variety of different areas where there's a lot of active and recent star formation. All right, so now we're going to jump ship a little bit and talk about active galactic nuclei, which is the other classification. Um, so active galactic nuclei uh, is the term for the active center in a galaxy. It's the matter and energy around the black holes, which is, are at the center of the galaxy that give off a lot of light. Galaxies with active centers are actually among the brightest objects in the universe. Um, but not all galaxies have an AGN. Um, for example, our galaxy is not active. Um, and what makes a galaxy active is not very well known, um, a little bit beyond the scope of my presentation, uh, but I do know that there's a lot that goes along with it. Um, and also we find that AGN produce very metal rich um, emission spectra. And so here I have a artistic rendering of an AGN. So we have the black hole at the center, the accretion disk that is surrounding the black hole, which is that orange region. And it's this region around the black hole that's highly energetic, that's going to be ionizing the surrounding gas, which is gonna be producing that emission spectrum that we're uh, obtaining. And this also has jets coming on either end. AGN come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. Um, for this presentation specifically, we'll, we won't be going into the exact detail of each AGN and um, the sort of qualities that go along with it. Um, but the most important thing to get from this is that we had that black hole at the center and that highly energetic material that's spinning around the um, the black hole, which is really, that's what's ionizing the surrounding gas. 
And here's a, another lovely picture. Here is a galaxy that is dominated by AGN. This is Centaurus A. And we can see that it has a remarkably bright center. And we can also see that it's got some jets you know, hanging out on either end. Okay. And so I want to take the time to closely look at H2 versus AGN and just look at them separately. So in, in H2 region, it's the stars that are exciting the gas. And consequently, in AGN, it's the energy and material around the black hole that excites the gas. And then in also in H2 regions, we see that there is a greater range of metallicity, which is the amount of metal that's present. Um, and in AGN, we see a lower range of metals, so they don't vary as much, but we see that AGN have a high metallicity. So they don't vary a whole lot, but they do have very high metallicities. So for H2 regions, you could have a variety of different metallicities, um, but for AGN, it's going to be typically a short range, but very high. And for H2 regions, we find that there is a relationship between temperature and metallicity. We actually find it to be an inverse relationship between the temperature and the amount of metals. And by inverse relationship, I mean with an increase in one, there will be a decrease in others. So when we see an increase in metallicity in an H2 region, we also see a corresponding decrease in temperature. But for AGN, we find that there is no relationship between temperature and the amount of metals. We actually find that AGN uh, are very metal rich and they are also high in temperature. So they, uh, they don't like to play by the rules. They, they kind of do their own thing. <laughs> okay, so, and just to touch a little bit about um, what the data we used was. So, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey obtained emission spectra from 10,617 galaxies. And so again, this is available on the public domain. This is the data release seven on the SDSS website. And so my mentor and I, we graphed the emission, particular emission line ratios, which are found to be tracers for temperature and velocity. And we were able to replicate something called the BPT diagram and see these relationships come through. And so on the right, I have a picture of the SDSS. Okay, so here is the data graphed and also color coded, spend some time on that. Um, we can see on the X axis, we have the metallicity, the amount of metals. And on the Y axis, we have the temperature. So this is a replica of the baldwin phillips Turlovich diagram. And this is the um, N203 one. There's three, I wanna say, I think there's three separate diagrams um, that kind of all try to classify star formation dominance or AGN dominance, but this is the one that has the most clear demarcations. So we actually, if anyone's able to annotate, um, which region do you think corresponds to the star formation regions? And which regions do you think correspond to the uh, AGN dominated. And so remember, AGN have a small range of metallicities, but are very high. Um, and then star formation regions have a large range. And we also see that there is an inverse relationship. So as we increase metallicity, so as we go to the right, we see a decrease in temperature. So that would be going down the y-axis. So feel free to unmute or annotate or pop in the chat if you have any thoughts on if maybe the yellow is the star formation region or if the blue is the star formation region. Um, so it's gonna be this region right here or this region right here. Which do you think is the uh, star formation dominant galaxies? Okay, so I see one vote for um, the yellow being the star formation dominant. Ooh, I see two votes. Ooh, it's getting crazy. Okay. All right. All right, awesome. Well, it seems that there are quite a few votes that the yellow is the star formation dominant um, region. And, 
Oh wait, I need to clear it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wait, no, that's not. Everybody okay, there it is. <laughs> kind of an anticlimactic. Um, <laughs> but you were correct. So all of the people that voted that that was the uh, star formation dominated region, great job. And of course, knowing that that's the star formation dominant, we see that also this is the AGN. And so just to highlight again, we see that there is an inverse relationship. So as we increase in metallicity, we see that there is a decrease in temperature. And then for AGN, we see that there is a smaller range there. We do have higher metallicities here. So it's, it's much higher than what we see in star formation regions. Um, but it also doesn't seem to follow any trends. So we see that it's also high in temperature. It's pretty high up on the y-axis, but it's also fairly high on the x-axis. Um, but we see that there's not really a trend to it. So you see how there's kind of this like a downward curve, so to speak. We don't really see that with AGN. There's not really a, a relationship that is there. Okay, but wonderful job. Thank you to everybody that contributed to that. Okay, and so, <laughs> um, and so we also did a population analysis. So out of 10,617 galaxies, I have another question for people. Uh, how many, do you think, well, you don't have to guess exact percentages. Um, I guess the main question is, do you think that most of the galaxies were dominated by star formation? Most were a little bit of both um, or were AGN dominated? So right here is gonna be the vote for star formation dominated, dominated and in the middle, there's a little bit of both. And then um, here's the AGN. So cast your votes and we'll see who wins. So I'm seeing that there appears to be a unanimous decision that the majority of the galaxies in this data set are going to be classified as star formation dominant. So let's see if everybody's correct. Okay, we've got 84%. We probably can't go much higher than that, but I guess we'll see the rest of the percentages. All right, that is correct. Everyone is correct. The majority of the galaxies, I'm gonna to try to clear this while I talk. Um, the majority of the galaxies in our data set were um, classified as uh, star formation dominant. And so, and for both of them, uh, we found a roughly 9.2% were dominated by both, or were dominated both by star formation and AGN. And we found roughly 6.8% of the galaxies in our data set were dominated by AGN. So based on our population analysis, uh, we found that most of the galaxies in our data set were classified as star formation dominant galaxies and the fewest being AGN dominated. So utilizing the data from the SDSS, we were able to replicate the BPT diagram and understand the significance of its shape and its relationship to physical properties. As well, this is very useful. Um, again, as I said earlier in the presentation, astronomers are able to um, know more about where the AGN are located, able to track stellar populations and star formation rates and, and things like that. So thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Um, I really enjoyed this project and thank you for allowing me to present my work. Okay. Nice. I will stop sharing the screen now if anybody has any questions. Hey, Mary, I wonder if if you were looking at a, a galaxy and you had this funky looking spectra spectrum from it, would you um, could you plot it on the BPT diagram and like learn uh, whether it was a the AGN that was causing the spectrum to look a certain way or it was an H that was dominated by star formation? When you mean a funky spectra, like if it's like redshifted or something like that, like. 
can you use your, can you use the BPT diagram to, um, I guess, provide more information? Like, I don't know if you're just trying to learn something about, maybe it's a galaxy that's at, at super high redshift. And so it's hard to get a high enough resolution or something. Can you, um, can you use it in that way that you can uncover more of the mystery of that galaxy based on its temperature and metallicity? Um, so I don't know definitively if the answer to that would be yes, but I would think that it would be. And also if the, this specific BPT diagram wasn't sufficient enough, there would be other, you could use the other diagrams or also other methods to kind of confirm um, what your findings would be or what conclusions you're thinking that would be drawn from that. Um, so I wish I had a better answer for that, but based on my current astro knowledge, that is what I would assume the answer would be. I have a curious question. Uh, the Sloan uh, survey uh, for the spectroscopy are fairly old galaxies that are near us at, at our little neighborhood of the universe. I was just wondering if we go farther back in time, and this is just a postulate, in other words, farther away from us, farther back in time, do you think AGNs would uh, increase or decrease? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking about galactic evolution. Mm -hmm. So I will preface this with, I'm not sure if I'm qualified really to answer that question. <laughs> Um, I'm not either. As I <laughs> <asked>. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really not sure, but if anybody here has any ideas, and has, I'm sure has more experience than I have, feel free to. That sounds in. like a good research project. To yeah. Yes, that's a good point. Yes, uh, we did when we were uh, graphing this, we, that was something that we were talking about, um, how exactly that correlates or how that would affect our data wasn't really something that we hit in our presentation, um, but that was something that, that did come up. All right, thank you so much, Mary. Yes. Okay, I guess that means it's my turn. Um, <laughs> so most of you know me already. Um, I am second year graduate student. I'm gonna pull up my, my PowerPoint. So um, I am a second year graduate student at OSU. And this uh, presentation, so I promised Cass that I would present my research every year or so. So um, the last time I talked about H2 regions and this time I'm gonna talk about supernova environments. Uh, this is work that I hope to expand on uh, to eventually work on for um, my PhD. This is my first year project. Um, okay, so I'm going to first just throw up a quick slide to show my advisors and my collaborators. I've been working with Adam Leroy and Laura Lopez at Ohio State, and I've been working with Diaz Otomo from NREO, and I've been working with the FANGS collaboration. Um, they study the physics at high angular resolution in nearby galaxies, and they're pretty cool. They are doing a systematic survey of nearby star forming galaxies in high angular resolution. So we're able to look at galaxies in a much more detailed way than, um, than what we're used to. So there's been some really cool science coming out from the FANGS collaboration. 
All right, so I want to start off by just letting us sort of brainstorm all the things we think of when we think of galaxies. So if you feel like unmuting or typing in the chat, um, what are things you think of when you think of a galaxy? What, what is in a galaxy? What are galaxies made of? I just realized that I can't see the chat. So if someone chats, maybe someone else can read it off to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, stars, dark matter. Gas, dust. Mm -hmm. Gas and dust, planets. I haven't seen aliens yet. <laughs> <Jump drops. laughs> Nebula. <laughs> Don't forget nebulas. Nebulae, yes. All right. So um, while you're thinking about all the things that we find in galaxies, um, so I'm going to clear this now uh, because I want to. I want to show you something. So I'm wondering, um, just as do you when you think of a galaxy do you think of a galaxy as something that changes over time and specifically something that changes like on smaller time scales. I think we know that galaxies evolve, um, but if you look at a galaxy in a telescope and then you come back a week later and look at that same galaxy in a telescope, do you think it's gonna look very different? No. Mm -hmm. No, so sometimes it doesn't look very different, but did you see that? Yeah. Did you see what just happened? Let me, let me uh, play it again. Do you see anything changing? A nova. Supernova. Mm -hmm. Supernova. Yeah. So that is a supernova. Um, yes. So we do know that galaxies change over time, uh, usually on longer time scales, but sometimes we get some uh, faster bits of change. And um, in, in my research, I am curious about how galaxies change over time. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and clear this again, sorry. Um, okay, so the focus of my research has been to learn about the explosion sites of supernovae. So this is a, a supernova remnant. It's a supernova that occurred a while back and we get to see it, the gas um, sort of spreading out and influencing the environment around it. So we know that older supernovae um, do have uh, interactions with their, their environment, but we actually don't know very much about the immediate environment that is in the, in the vicinity of a supernova when it explodes. And the reason why is because there's sort of a lack of high resolution data to study these environments. Uh, most of what astronomers know about supernova environments is theoretical in nature and it has been studied by creating computer simulations and basically uh, fine tuning the variables to see what outcomes look more like what we see when we look through a telescope. Uh, we, we do have good theories though, so we'll talk about those. Um, but the ultimate goal of my work is to take this new data that's coming in from, from the FANGS collaboration and to study a sample of recent supernovae using this new data and basically just compiling some information about what their environments look like, because now we can actually get in a little closer and study them. All right, so as you saw, the title of my talk is uh, Measuring the Cold Gas Near Recent Supernovae. I was wondering if anyone would want to unmute and guess why we care about gas. Why do we care about the gas in galaxies? Star formation. Yes, you are one step ahead. So um, we care about gas because it's where stars and planets form. So this is a simulation of what happens if you leave gas alone and let it do its thing. Sometimes you got to push on it a little bit, give it a little bit of turbulence um, to get it moving. And then um, the gas will start to clump together under its own gravity. And, um, and then interesting things will happen. So in this simulation, the lighter colors are uh, where it becomes denser. So we started with this gas, but this yellow is sort of becoming molecular clouds. We're getting these 
clouds forming and now there's white things. Can anybody tell me what those white things are? Harder elements, you start to get planets. Propolids. So those are stars. So this is a, a oh. big simulation. Those are stars actively forming in these clouds that have formed in the gas. So the gas clumps to form clouds and the clouds are where they're colder and molecules form there. And then those clump even further to get to star formation. And you see that when these stars form, some of them are staying kind of close with those clouds and some of them are being flung sort of away from the gas. So after this simulation runs its course, we're gonna zoom back out and see how um, everything looks in the larger context. All right, so you can see that some of these stars are still within their clouds. So the birth cloud is still hosting those stars. And then some of the stars have, have traveled on, they've ran away from their, from their birth environment. Okay, so now we know that gas forms stars but I want to make sure that we all know what happens to those stars at the end of their lives. So we watch the stars be born and now we're going to watch the stars die. Stars do die in their own way. Um, so there are two different pathways your stars can travel on in their life. And it depends on how massive they are when they form. Uh, we have lower medium mass stars, which will burn their fuel and eventually they'll turn into a white dwarf. And the higher mass stars will burn their fuel and eventually they will explode. Sometimes they might implode, but there's still research going on about that. But usually it ends in some sort of boom. Um, I want to convince you though, that uh, both of these pathways can end up in a supernova. And I know you'll look at this and say, Ness, I only see one supernova on that plot, but I'm gonna show you how these smaller stars can also become supernovae too. So when a low mass star becomes a supernova, it's called a type 1a supernova. And this is because the low mass stars will end up as slowly cooling white dwarfs. And if the conditions are just right and they have a companion star, they can accrete material or pull material onto them until they become so massive that they become a giant thermonuclear explosion. I'm gonna play that one more time just because it's fun to watch. Um, so these are, these are unpredictable. That white dwarf might never find a companion. It might never get that extra material. It might never have a collision. It might be a white dwarf for a very long time. So we can't always predict when this will happen or even if it will happen. Now, the high mass stars are much easier to predict in some ways. Um, these high mass stars will burn their fuel very quickly. They're, um, they're like gas guzzlers. They're like the Hummer of the star world, whereas the, the lower mass stars are like the Prius. They'll just go and go on the same tank. Um, but they will use up all of their fuel and they will have a core collapse and they will just explode. And this happens in a very predictable amount of time. That's actually pretty quickly after that star was born relative to the type 1a supernova. Um, I told you these are called core collapse supernova. They're also called types 2, types 1b, types 1c. Basically anything that's not type 1a uh, in this talk is a core collapse and it comes from a massive star. Okay, so supernova occur all throughout galaxies. So wherever you have stars that are being formed, you can expect to find a supernova. Um, I'll talk more about what this image represents later, but this is galaxy NGC 4321. And the bright color in here, so the, the color that you see represents molecular gas. So this is the place where the stars will form. And the brighter the color, the more yellow the color, um, the denser the, the gas. And I wanted to kind of poll the audience I wanted to ask um, if you had, oh, sorry, I had a test poll, but I'm not gonna do that, it's too late. Okay, so I wanted to send this poll to you. So if you had to guess how many supernovae we would expect to find in this galaxy in the last 121 years, so since 1900, how many supernovae do you think we would find? And there are no wrong answers. This is just, I just wanna know what your intuition is about how frequent supernova are. Can everybody see the poll? Okay. 
All right. Great. Okay, it's been 30 seconds, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and I'll show the results. So it looks like there's kind of almost a tie. So the majority of you think two to 10, and a lot of you think 10 to 100, and a couple think zero. And, oh wait, sorry, I didn't share the results. Um, this is my first time giving a poll in Zoom. Uh, <laughs> so um, this is cool. I'm glad that there's like, that the intuition is split within the group. So I think um, I think I, I would have expected there to be a lot. Um, and and so to, to confuse matters more, I'll tell you that um, the rate of supernova in galaxies is usually one per century. So in, in spiral galaxies, we expect to find one supernova for every 100 years. So for counting since 1900, that tells me that we might expect one supernova here. But this galaxy is a bit different. That's why I like it. This galaxy has six. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see that um, these, these supernovae occur sort of all throughout. I see one in a really bright region. I see one in a not so bright region. They're kind of all around. Um, and so as, as someone doing research on this, it, it makes me have some, some questions. I have some questions. One of my questions is, what happens to the gas that's nearby where these supernova explode? Does it blow away? Does it, does it clump together and form stars? Does it just sit there? I don't know. Um, and I'd like to learn more about that. And then another question I have is, if we compile enough data about these supernova, can we become sort of uh, so, um, so familiar with them that we can start predicting when they're going to come and where they're going to come? Is that something that we'll ever have the power to do? All right, so I'm going to move on and we're gonna take a look at our first question here. So what happens to the gas that is nearby where supernova explode? So this is a question that a research team called SILK, Stimulating the Life Cycle of Molecular Clouds, tried to explore. And these simulations that I'm gonna introduce you to are the uh, moment, the, the wow moment, where I realized that this was what I wanted to work on. So SILK built a simulation to try to answer these questions. And I'm going to describe how the simulation works because it's a little confusing to look at. So if you look on the left, there's this blue bar of a model of the gas in the midplane of a galaxy. And what I drew on this galaxy here is sort of what that panel is demonstrating. So if you have a spiral galaxy, you can sort of, some of them will be edge on where they're kind of turned like this and you can look and you just see the middle of the galaxy. So if, for example, gas got ejected from the galaxy, kind of like Mary's AGN, we saw the gas was coming out from the midplane. And so this uh, simulation takes this, this midplane, and so this is all computer model. This, isn't, this is all a, a generated simulation. And in the center where it's more orange, that's the, the denser gas, and it gets more blue as the density drops. So in the dark blue regions, that means there's no gas there. So this is, I know it's really confusing and, and um, there's not, there's not a, a whole lot that I want you to take away from this except for just to see what happens to the gas. So this is how their simulation uh, was designed. They have a lot of different parameters that they're, that they're monitoring after they put the supernova in. So they look at things like the density and the temperature. And then they have, you can see the last four panels. We have H plus, which is a um, ionized hydrogen. We have regular hydrogen molecular hydrogen and carbon monoxide. So these are all different variants of the hydrogen and the gas that's in this galaxy. So I really just want you to, to see what happens when I turn on the supernova, but if you want to fixate on a panel, please look at this panel right here. This is gonna be the gas in the midplane of the galaxy. And this is what I'm curious what that supernova, what supernova are gonna do to this gas. And you can also look at this panel next to it which is going to show the molecular gas. So these clouds that will eventually form stars. So we start with none of them. We just have loose gas. I'm gonna go ahead and play the simulation. 
And we're going to just see what happens when we turn on supernova in the galaxy. So you can see there's definitely some changes. The galaxy is definitely changing with time. What kind of things do you notice? Yeah. A lot of gas. It looks like the gas is just getting blasted away, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And then if you look over here, we have some little molecular clouds that are forming. So that's pretty cool. But really, we're just going to focus on focus on the gas today. I like I like the notes. <laughs> um, uh, all right. So I am going to clear. I'm going to clear the annotations real quick for the next slide. Um, all right. So uh, now, so we we know we can now say that the supernova are definitely doing something to the gas. Like if you have a supernova next to gas, something will happen. Um, okay, so one thing that the uh, Silk Collaboration noticed when they ran this simulation, so so they because they're using a computer, they can they can sort of change the parameters around um, quite a bit and see what happens when they put different uh, initial conditions. So one thing that they noticed was that they could get different end results. So these three panels on the right could be different based on where they put their supernova. So um, for example, um, okay, so, so we'll talk more about how they change the supernova, but, uh, but just by putting the supernova in different positions in your galaxy, you can have a different end result of where your gas goes. So in my own research, I made some models. So we'll bounce back and forth a little bit. Um, I made some models that would put supernova in different places. So I'm wondering when you look at this, can you tell the difference? Can you, do you notice any differences between these two models? So these, uh, the white asterisks are supernova. And I'm just wondering if you can tell what the difference is between them. Second one, you got money of them right there in the center, the core. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What is the, um, is there, do you notice that a difference in the gas in the core? It might be. My guess is it might even be an early stage in the evolution of the galaxy itself. Oh, that's interesting. Guestimate. Yeah. Guestimate. That's interesting. Okay, I'm going to keep the I'm going to keep this circle here um, on the annotation. I'm going to give you all a little task now. Um, so, in these models that I made, I have in one of the models I have made it so the supernova only go off or preferentially go off in molecular clouds where the gas is really dense. And in the other model, I made it so that the supernova would be assigned to be randomly distributed throughout the entire galaxy. They would just, it wouldn't, they wouldn't choose to go off in the clouds, they would just go off randomly. I'm wondering if, if you could use annotate to circle either random or peak for which of, for each of the models. See if you can figure out which model has supernova going off randomly and which model has supernova only going off preferentially in, um, in molecular clouds. You guys are so good at this. The left is random. <laughs> yep, yep. So the left is just random and the right is just peak density. All right, so while you're circling that, I guess I think most of you have already circled it. I wonder if you can start to think, so, so I'm, I'm, I forgot to warn you about this, but in this talk, I'm dragging you all through the research with me. So you all are, are now doing this research with me and you're gonna ju jump to the same conclusions with the experiments that I did. So I'm wondering, can you start thinking about predictions? What do you think is gonna happen to the gas in, this, in the galaxy on the left versus the gas in the galaxy on the right? So if we're only blowing up supernova in really dense molecular clouds, do you think we're going to keep most of the gas or do you think we're going to lose most of it? 
And um, you don't have to write anything down because I'm going to have another activity coming up. I'm gonna go ahead and clear, clear all of the markings for now. We'll go on to the next slide. Okay, so this is random and peak. All right, so I have isolated the panels of the guests. So Silk did this also, and this was a um, very motivational simulation for me. So in one of these panels, we have supernova only going off in molecular clouds, and the other is going to have the supernova going off randomly. So I'm gonna play the simulations, and then we're gonna guess which one was which. You can already see a difference in how the gas is behaving. The one on the right has cavities being formed, cavities of no gas. And the one on the left is still has most of the gas there. It's just getting poofier, or more flocculent. All right, so can you um, annotate, draw a line from which model you think goes with which simulation? Um, I think this is probably here. All right. Great. Okay, so this is what I thought too. Um, and the interesting thing is, it's actually the other way around. Whoa. Yeah. So, really? Yes. So <laughs> when you put your supernova, okay, so let's let's brainstorm about this together. How? Why? Why do you think? How could this even be possible? If you're only blowing up your supernova in the clouds, how did the clouds stay there? Can you help me brainstorm this? Is it gravitational? I think that could play a role. I definitely think that could be, I think that that could be definitely part of it. The material gets slowed down by the gas. The shock wave is kind of dragged along by the gas, or, or slowed down by the by by hitting the gas. And then when it's not, when it's random and there's no gas in the way, the the shock wave spreads out more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's like when you when you have this this energetic explosion in the middle of a cloud, that cloud is still there to kind of buffer it. So what the supernova is doing is it's adding turbulence to that cloud, which interestingly is what that cloud needs to form stars, which is kind of a cool, a cool um, aside. Uh, but yeah, if you're if you're only put, if your supernova are going off in really diffuse regions, that gas is just going to be blasted right, right out of the, the galactic disk. So I thought that was really cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and clear these annotations once again and move on. Okay, so I'm just going back to this to this point. So we we know that our different uh, different supernova locations can cause different outcomes, and we know that if we put the supernova and the peak density, so in the molecular clouds, we'll keep our gas. And if we only put our supernova uh, randomly, they'll be more likely to be in diffuse areas and they'll be a lot more likely to blow the gas out of the galaxy. But the trick is if we look at galaxies, we find something that's closer to the panel in the middle. And so that can tell us that we probably don't have all of our supernova in clouds and we probably don't have them all in more diffuse areas. So the Silk team that worked on these, um, simulations defined a mixed model where they had about a third of their supernova occurring randomly and two thirds occurring in these peak regions. All right, so I'm going to um, tie some of these threads together. Um, so we talked about the types of supernova. 
So just as a reminder, the core collapse supernova are from massive stars. They occur quickly after the star forms. And the type 1A are from the low mass stars. They occur a long time after the star forms, if at all. So one thing that I wanted to look at was since we can actually go outside and look at these galaxies now, and we can measure how much gas is near these supernovae, I wanted to see if we could tie the types of supernovae to the models that we talked about. So I wanted to see if you all could guess. So if you had to pick a model for each type, which would you choose? So would you think that um, you could you could describe your core collapse with a random model or a peak model? Do you have a good idea about it? And then so the reminder, the hint is that the stars form in dense clouds of gas. So the way to think about this is if your core club supernova is occurring very quickly after the star formed, there's probably a higher chance that it's gonna be closer to that cloud of gas. Even if it was thrown out, like in that simulation we saw, it still would probably be a little bit closer than if it took longer for it to occur. So you all have a pretty good intuition about this. So yes, um, the, uh, sorry, let me clear this annotation. <laughs> They should have just one button instead of going through the menu and make it easier. Okay, so we have we have this hypothesis, right? Um, but we haven't we haven't proved anything yet. We haven't actually done any uh, observing. So we have a good theory for where the supernova occur. Uh, we think two thirds are going to occur in molecular clouds, and one third are going to occur randomly. Interestingly, two thirds of supernova are core collapse and one third are type 1A on average. So this seems like a pretty solid hypothesis. Um, okay, so we haven't um, completely observed this yet. So this is where my work comes in. I wanna see if, if by doing observations, if we find that our hypothesis is supported. All right, so um, what do we see when we look at the actual supernova, not just the models? All right, so in my work, I look at the molecular gas within a population of nearby star forming spiral galaxies. So these images that you've been seeing are caused by emission from carbon monoxide molecules that are transitioning from one rotational state to another. So these molecules rotate and vibrate and they do all kinds of stuff. And um, this map, these maps in particular are caused uh, when the molecule is rotating and it relaxes a little, it loses a little bit of energy. And to quote my advisor, big floppy photons are produced that are then detected in our radio telescopes. And I just wanna point out, I think it's super amazing how we can detect stuff like this from earth. Like we can find a signature from a molecule that rotated differently that's billions of light years away. And I think that's pretty amazing. So once we had mapped out all the molecular gas of these galaxies, we look at um, a supernova catalog and identify the supernova that have occurred in these galaxies. Um, so all of these supernova that are in here occurred after 1900, so 1900 or later. And the reason why we want recent supernova that haven't had time to influence the gas so that we can measure the gas and uh, know that it's the same measurement as if that supernova hadn't gone off yet. Um, we compare, so we measure the gas at the location of the supernova, and then we compare that with measurements from the entire galaxy. So we look at every single pixel in these maps. And we run statistics on what the, um, what the molecular gas is doing. And then we look at specifically what it's doing where the supernova are. Um, we also look at, so we define how bright a molecular cloud would be on this map. And we measure how uh, close each supernova is to the nearest molecular cloud. So we might expect core collapse supernova to be closer to a molecular cloud than a type 1A. So we're doing statistics on that. 
And then we use these two models that I, that I showed you for our hypothesis to run statistics on this as well. So we'll look at these random, randomly generated supernova, do the same measurements for them and compare them to the real ones. We see how intense the emission was, how close it was to the nearest molecular cloud. We do this um, randomly generated and for the peak density generated. So if the supernova are completely unrelated to the molecular gas, we expect to find them more randomly spread out just like this. And if the supernova go um, to tend to go off in molecular clouds, we would expect to see them more located in these peak regions, like in, the, in these models. All right, so now we have all this data, billions and billions of pieces of data. So we then perform a statistical analysis on all of our data. And then by collecting and analyzing uh, all the data, we get to our results finally. So what we found is that the proximity and amount of molecular gas changes based on the supernova type. We do find that two thirds of supernova occur nearby or within molecular clouds. And these supernova are predominantly core collapse. These are the massive stars that are blowing up there. The remaining one third occur more randomly distributed in galaxies and are more often in regions of diffuse gas. And these are also predominantly type 1A. Um, by collecting and analyzing this data, we learned that our best models and theories are supported by our observations. And we now have this empirical data that can be used to refine the simulations. Although we can't predict exactly where the next supernova is going to occur or what type it will be, we can say where it's more likely to occur. And we are building up an understanding of how these supernova environments are related to its type. And we're constructing a framework to explore these environments further. So this leads me to my future work slide. Um, we have, uh, we have, we are waiting to get more maps to do more galaxies and study more supernova, but we also want to study more aspects of the supernova environment. So right now we've looked at the molecular clouds, which is where stars will form. We also want to look at star formation that is currently happening and or has recently happened. And we wanna look at stellar populations um, and also stellar remnants. We'd like to be able to paint a picture of what a supernova environment looks like for the very first time. And um, I want to introduce, so I will take any questions also, but I wanna introduce as part of this future work, our next talk will be by Brendan Kirsch. He is my mentee and he has been doing this future work actively. He's been doing the same work looking at uh, star formation tracers and his talk will be next. So if there are any questions, I can take them. Well, okay. one, you just had to have Commander Data in there, didn't you? <laughs> I did. You know, my last talk, I had a Star Trek meme that I made myself, and this time I, I borrowed one. Well, I got something I don't know if you know about it. A long time ago, they had a sci-fi joint in Westerville. I went up there, meet and greet, and got signatures from uh, Scotty, Monk, um, James Duhan. Well, he already had Alzheimer's. That's what did him in. But um, there was some lady there waiting in line. She had a tape. Um, Commander Data, Brent Spiner did an album singing Frank Sinatra standards and it was called Old Yellow Eyes is Back. I kid wow. you not. I kid you not. That's what he did. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Are there any questions on on my presentation? Ness? Um, yeah. How good is a is carbon monoxide as a proxy for all the other gas? I mean, do you get carbon monoxide bunching up in places that doesn't correspond to the gas or is it, do they map pretty well onto each other? So if you have carbon monoxide, you definitely have molecular hydrogen for sure. But sometimes you have molecular hydrogen without carbon monoxide. 
So what happens is um, the molecular hydrogen is harder to observe um, and, and well, it's, it's trickier to observe. And when these, when the gas clumps together, uh, you'll have sort of um, different, you have like a stratification of your molecules. So uh, ultraviolet light is more likely to, um, it will dissociate carbon monoxide much easier than um, molecular hydrogen. So you'll have like carbon monoxide mixed into the center of your cloud. And then you'll have a region that's just molecular hydrogen without carbon monoxide. And there are regions that have enough UV radiation where there is no carbon monoxide present. So these are called CO dark. So you'll have CO dark clouds where you, you won't see CO at all. So if you look at these maps, if you just looked at it like a molecular hydrogen map, I'm sure you would see um, quite a lot more lit up regions than you do in just the CO map itself. The, those CO dark regions would be like very new and hot young star clusters with a lot of O stars and things like that. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. Um, well, I'm going to pass the Zoom torch on to my mentee. I'm very excited to uh, introduce. Um, Brendan is a first year at OSU and He's majoring in astronomy and physics. Um, and in his free time, he likes to do origami. And the topic of Brendan's talk is, is it H alpha emission intensity in NGC 1365? Yeah, just about. Good. <laughs> All right, cool. So yeah, take it away, Brendan. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. So here I am with a brief corollary. Let me disable some of these. You might have some gray boxes on your screen right now. Um, get rid of some of these. Okay, there we go. Should be all good now. So I have a brief corollary here to uh, Ness's presentation. We're going to be measuring the hydrogen alpha in the galaxy NGC 1365. Um, this is an image of the galaxy to the right here. Um, it's also known as the Great Barred Spiral Galaxy. So um, supernovae. Um, I know maybe it's a little unprofessional to say, but I think everybody thinks they're, they're pretty cool, right? I mean, they're just like big explosions in space, right? It's a star exploding. They're pretty awesome. As but, long um, as your starship's <laughs> not near one. Fair enough. That would be very bad <laughs> if that happened right next to it. Yeah, I can agree with that. But um, we still, as Ness was saying, we still don't know um, a ton of information about them. There's a lot of information, a lot of questions left unanswered. Um, but, you know, she was talking about there's new technologies now with this high resolution imaging that we can use to, you know, zoom in greater and get better detail of these galaxies and these supernovae. Um, and so we want to use this new technology to try and learn about the environments um, near supernovae. And so a question that we've been asking with these supernovae is, you know, um, if there's this uh, explosion, um, can there, you know, still be star formation there? We want to know, can this gas that creates star that, you know, stars eventually form from, can more than one star form in that area? If we have gas for a star and then that star explodes and there's still gas there, can another star form? So we're just basically trying to learn information about the environments near supernovae. And so with um, our method, we uh, measured the uh, light emission of hydrogen alpha. So I'm going to tell you about that. Uh, why hydrogen alpha? What even is hydrogen alpha? Um, if you can remember back to uh, Mary's presentation earlier tonight, these um, absorption and emission spectrum diagrams may be a little familiar to you. Um, to the left here, we have just an image of a just an atom with the electron uh, shells, the orbits where the electrons are found. So I'll explain to you what hydrogen atom is, why we are hydrogen alpha is, sorry, and why we use that. Um, so these hot and massive stars out in space are surrounded by clouds of gas, right? And these clouds of gas are composed um, mostly of hydrogen. And so these uh, big bright stars, um, will send out ultraviolet light and these hydrogen atoms can absorb this ultraviolet light. And this may cause um, an electron to be stripped from the uh, hydrogen atom, ionizing it. And this electron can eventually find its way to a new nucleus and it'll recombine with that new atom. And as it falls to the lowest um, 
orbit for the electron. That's its lowest energy state. So it wants to go to the lowest orbit. As it goes to that orbit, it will emit light at a certain wavelength. And so this emission line that we are studying here is the hydrogen alpha emission line. And that uh, has a wavelength of 656 nanometers. As you can see, it's a red color. And so hydrogen alpha is one of the brightest emissions that we see. So it's uh, one of the easiest to um, observe and record. And so the measurement of how bright the levels of H alpha are can act as an indicator for the number of stars there. And thus we can use that to infer the rate of star formation or just more generally whether or not this star formation is occurring. So hydrogen alpha is useful because it tells us where stars are forming. And sometimes we can extrapolate that to see um, what the rate is based on the intensity of the hydrogen alpha. So next here, we have a narrow band H alpha image of our galaxy, NGC 1365. And that just basically means technical talk for, uh, we put a filter over the lens. Well, I didn't specifically, but whoever recorded this put a filter over the lens and this only lets in a specific wavelength of light, which is our hydrogen alpha wavelength. And so the brighter portions here, we have a lot of you know purple, these brighter yellower orange red portions are um, uh, regions of, where hydrogen alpha is located. So the brighter a region is, the higher intensity there is of hydrogen alpha being emitted. So next we have some figures here uh, relating to the intensity of hydrogen alpha near the supernovae. Um, now the axes of these figures may be a little bit weird. Um, you can see like greater than, less than symbols. Um, basically the big takeaway that I want you to take from these is the further right you get on the x-axis, um, the further along you get, the higher the emission intensity of our hydrogen alpha is going to be. So with our histogram here, um, you can see the blue bars. Um, and these bars represent a fraction of the pixels within our map. So we took all of our pixels with our data and we sorted it. There was something like 30 million pixels, I want to say. And we sorted those in intensity of like, brightness because you know the brighter that pixel is that's more h alpha in that region so we have these blue bars here and if you take the top of those and you add them all up they're going to add up to one or 100 percent so those are all the pixels and um, then the golden bars are the supernova data and we can see that um, on average total the supernova actually have a higher h alpha um, emission intensity and so you see this one bar to the far right, the gold bar is in one of the portions where none of the other pixels are found. So we can see that, that the supernova has a much higher um, intensity uh, of H alpha compared to the rest of the pixels in the map. Um, then to the right, we have a cumulative distribution function of our data. And you don't know what that, you don't need to know what that means. Basically, we just have this line here that kind of adds up, you know, it's cumulative and it adds up the fraction of all of our pixels. And as we go along and add up all of our pixels together, you can follow the line and you can see that the H alpha, the total H alpha intensity um, increases. Um, each of these gold stars here represent um, the locations of our supernova. So we have the type 1A, type 2, and the type 1C. If you remember, uh, Ness was talking about these same types of supernovae in her presentation. So I want to send out a poll for you guys um, about which one of you, which one of these um, types of supernova do you think is the one most associated with star formation? So this one uh, isn't too tricky. I promise it's not a trick question. Just you have the, the X axis. You might see a gray box on my screen here. Don't worry about that. Um, put this away. But um, as the you go further along the X axis, that's more H alpha intensity. So which one of these star, uh, supernovae here do you think is the most associated with star formation? And then I will give that a couple more seconds and then share the results and see what you guys said. <clears throat> all right, and um, I have a gray box again, that's all right. So actually, um, we got a tie, which is surprising. One vote for each of these, so three-way tie. So actually, the um, supernovae with the most 
most associated with star formation is our type 1c, the farthest to the right. So that one is the farthest to the right along the x-axis, so that has the greatest H-alpha intensity. Um, and then um, Ness had been talking about trying to relate um, you know, sort of phenomena with the supernova to see if we could maybe predict where things are going to occur. Um, so we can sort of look here and we're trying to see how far away from the blue line all of these supernovae data points are. And so notice that each one of them is to the right of the blue line, meaning that there is more H alpha intensity to them compared to the rest of the pixels in the map. Were we to take just a random sample of pixels from our data and we were to sort them according to their H alpha intensity, they would have a lower H alpha intensity compared to the supernovae because they are to the right of the line indicating they have a greater intensity of H alpha compared to the rest of the pixels at that point. Um, and so the type 1a, that's the one that Ness was talking about, um, how uh, it's uh, least associated with star formation. So type 1c is the most associated with star formation. We can kind of see that pattern the most. Um, I'm not going to make any sort of definitive statement here and say that um, type 1c always occurs near star formation or something like that. Absolutely not. Not saying any of that, but it's just interesting to note out of our sample size of three here that um, each supernova uh, met uh, all of our expectations because type 1a is typically the least associated with star formation. And on our plot, we can see that it's the closest to the blue line, indicating that it's the closest expected to what we would see. So it doesn't really have much higher star formation compared to just any random point, um, any random region in the galaxy, right? But then type 1c um, is, it can be a little hard to tell because the line does sort of flatten out at the top where there's the, the 1.0, but um, our line hits 1.0 pretty far back compared to where our star for 1c is. Just the H alpha intensity is probably around 10 times uh, as much compared to where our line actually reaches the point of one. So we can see the type 1c has much higher uh, levels of H alpha intensity compared to even the other supernovae found within our plot. So finally, I just have um, another image of the galaxy here, but now I have zoomed in and I've labeled each one of the supernovae. So we have the type with the name. And so we have the type 1a here. This was the kind that was the least associated with star formation, right? And if you can kind of see in the middle there, um, it's in a very dark region, indicating that there's no um, little to no H alpha there, which means that there's little to no star formation there compared to um, our type 1c here. That was one that was most associated with star formation. If you can look in the center there, you can see that it's got right in the center a little bright spot indicating that there's more H alpha there. So um, the image matches up with what we expect. So um, very interesting. So then uh, that's about all. We can talk about what, ne what next um, conclusions we can draw from this. We can now see that we have a little more information on supernova environments. Um, the supernova, the supernova are usually occurring um, a long time after star formation has begun. So it's not like a supernova goes off and then a star forms after it because usually these supernovae are more recent because um, we wanna see the behavior that's happening with these supernovae right after they explode. Because if we're looking at them after a long time, um, they may just be remnants. Um, I know Ness showed some images of supernova remnants. Um, for what we're studying here, we wanna see the behavior as or shortly after it has exploded and we wanna see how that affects the environment around it. Um, so we're examining recent supernovae, but we can see here that um, in those regions, star formation does still occur after um, supernovae occur, which it wouldn't be unreasonable to think maybe that uh, supernovae could affect star formation either way because um, that explosion could disrupt the gas. Ness showed different examples how the gas could either be could stay condensed or it could be launched out into different directions and that could have various impacts on star formation. So future work would be to gather more data with this um, project here. We only looked at three supernovae in one galaxy, right? So not 
um, a huge sample size, but if we could bump that up to a larger amount, we could see more patterns maybe, and like Ness said, try and find potential predictions in the future for um, where supernovae may occur. Um, and then going beyond star formation, Ness showed other phenomena that we could look at to see if there are different things where supernovae may occur. So yeah, just as Ness said, same here, future work is just trying to find maybe potential locations in space where uh, supernovae occur, look for patterns, and maybe one day we could predict uh, where those guys are going to literally pop up. So um, thanks so much for having me, guys. Hope you learned something. I will take any questions if you guys have any, but that is all that I have. Let me stop this here for a second. And steer your starship clear from them. Stay away from them. <laughs> Definitely. I, I agree. I would not want to be in a ship when that happened. Mm -mm. What the the fact that those stars, you know, in the galaxy appeared to the right of the uh, the, the model line, um, could that have anything to do with the fact that there was, you know, a resolution limit in the yeah this this one, um, in the ability to to resolve the H two regions? I mean, maybe the H two regions are smeared out a little bit because you don't have perfect resolution uh, with your telescope. And, and so they're, they appear to be a little bit more enmeshed in, uh, in H alpha regions than, not, you know, they're not actually in them. They're just, they're off to the side or, or we're seeing them in front of or behind um, the H2 regions and that kind of thing. And so they, they glom onto the top of them or did the model kind of take that into consideration? I'm learning here too, so I, I can really have an answer to that. We kind of, I think Nest here, I was working with her, we just got um, data and I don't know if we know exactly how their model worked, Nest, if you have any other answers. It's not a very big sample size, you know, so. I, yeah, yeah it's that's, different. it's a good question, Brad. I think, um, so the resolution is gonna be the same for each pixel and for the supernova, because we're using the, we're using the same map and we're just taking a single pixel coordinate and pulling the value. So those values are actually getting double counted in a sense. Um, yeah. We have, uh, so we have 30 million pixels and they span the range of 10 to the negative two to 10 to the two, right? And then we're picking only three of those. And, um, and then we're saying, what is the, the intensity at this specific pixel where the supernova is going off? And the resolution is on the order of 150 parsecs, um, which is pretty big. I mean, we'd like to get for like, looking specifically at a supernova environment, we'd like to get smaller, um, but, yeah, so this is 150. So this is one arc second resolution. Um, but yeah, so they're they're they are we are comparing apples to apples here. We're just comparing 30 million apples to three apples. <laughs> just curious is how how far does a you know O or A type star be, uh, wander before it goes supernova? I mean, you know, they could be your your model in 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 your little simulation there of the of the stars forming. Um, you know, shows the stars getting flung every which way. Um, I mean, they, they don't live very long, so they, how, how far are they expected to travel from the initial H uh, alpha region before they uh, pop? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so I know, so I will be digging into this deeper, but I don't actually know the answer off the top of my head. I do know that it's something like, 80% of O stars and 40% of B stars. And those numbers might be juxtaposed and they might be off by about 10% each, but it's it's a high amount of stars run away from their, their, from their natal clouds. And I think velocity is like 200 kilometers per second, 50 kilometers per second, something like that. So um, yeah, that's something that, that we should definitely consider moving forward, see how far they can get. Yeah, if anybody else has anything else, then um, I suppose we could throw it back to Ness for closing remarks, I presume. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to thank thank all the uh, Polaris mentees from coming and presenting today. Y'all did really great. And 
was a ton of fun working with you. Um, I'm going to just leave the meeting open for people to chat or ask further questions or take off if y'all are tired. Yeah, thanks. Oh, and maybe we can stop the Facebook. I haven't been monitoring Facebook. I don't know, are people commenting on Facebook? Yes. Oh. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I see. We are due. We're due for a supernova. Well, cool. you know, in 1987, the small, I wrote this on the chat, the small Magellanic cloud had one in 1987 it was visible to the naked eye if you lived south of the equator mm -hmm. but i was in california so it was no deal but if you live down under south africa new zealand they got to see it <laughs> james i was living in uh, brazil until about two weeks before the uh, supernova went off. <laughs> oh no! I left, I left Brazil. I left with Brazil, just painfully close to when the supernova was discovered. Oh no! <laughs> oh rats! <laughs> And to this date, I've never been south of the equator. I've seen Omega Centauri, but I got lucky. So Ness, what, what uh, telescopes are, are getting those radio observations? Yeah, so that's the ALMA array. The Atacama, wait, Atacama large um, multi millimeter and then slash sub millimeter array so down, in Chile. Down in Chile, yeah. Mm -hmm. up, up high. Yep. Big floppy photons. I had to use that in my talk. My professor said that and I was like, this has to be a meme somewhere. Yeah, I just, I, like, I love it. It's so visual. <laughs> I like the big floppy photons because it's pretty descriptive. They're not little sharp gamma mm -hmm. ray photons you know they're big floppy radio photons <laughs> that's that's a cute yeah. way of putting it i'm gonna steal that yeah, there was <laughs> yeah. one other thing that i wanted to steal as well um the comparison of o-type stars as hummers mm -hmm. and and Priuses. you know f and you know k stars as priuses or you know your bicycle or whatever that was actually a really clever we use that in our astronomy lab for the for the um, non majors. We use that as an analogy to try to teach the like the the mass age relation. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to steal that one. So <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. OK, I'm going to stop the uh, the Facebook stream. So, OK. Uh, oh, no, I didn't know it was still going. That's OK. I mean, <laughs> first of all, no, it, it, it had died down. So, so, okay. We're okay. so I will stop it now. Bye, guys. Uh, Bye, Facebook. Bye, Facebook. <laughs> Bye, Facebook.